Hello and welcome to the second lesson in antibiotic allergy. My name is Jackson Stewart and in this video we'll focus on drug-induced cutaneous reactions, specifically where we'll discuss how we can recognize and diagnose both uncommon and common rashes caused by antibiotics and the specific hypersensitivity syndromes they are associated with. I have no disclosures to report. The main problem with the management of drug-induced rashes is that most physicians do not spend the time needed to recognize the specific syndrome associated with the rash or even describe the rash phenotype in a way that leads to proper diagnosis. Instead, patients will simply be documented to have a history of a rash non-specifically or some less descriptive term like maculopapular rash that is difficult retrospectively to evaluate. In this lesson, we'll talk about how you can speak the language for describing drug eruptions in a useful way and then talk about specific drug hypersensitivity syndromes that are commonly associated with skin reactions. With each syndrome, notice that reactions tend to occur in a specific time frame, and we'll use this knowledge to propose ways that you can perform a thoughtful exposure analysis to identify the right culprit agent. Drug rashes are extremely common and account for a significant proportion of adverse effects. Most drug hypersensitivity syndromes are associated with cutaneous reactions, so allergy assessment goes hand in hand with rash identification and description. There seems to be several predisposing factors to develop drug-induced rashes since they only occur in a minority of patients. In many cases, drug eruptions are described as being idiosyncratic, that is another way of saying that we're not sure of the mechanism. However, as we'll discuss later, many drug-induced rashes are known to be immunologic in nature, i.e. T-cell mediated hypersensitivities or otherwise. In this way, it is expected that genetic predispositions specifically for delayed type reactions could play a large role in the pathogenesis. Interestingly, it is known that several immunomodulating viruses, i.e. viruses that can infect or affect cellular immunity, can predispose patients to developing drug rashes. Recall the well-described amoxicillin rash when used for infectious mononucleosis, a primary EBV infection. But this could be the case for several other viruses that might go undetected, for example, HHV6. Ultimately, you may have no great way of knowing for your specific patient if they will be susceptible or not to many of these reactions, but temporary risk factors, i.e. acute viral illness, may be a clue that future exposure will not lead to similar reactivity. As we've mentioned, there are several HLA types already identified and known to predispose patients to developing specific drug-induced rashes. These are best studied for the severe type drug rashes where exposure could be fatal, for example, SJS and TEN. However, we should be seriously considering that many more benign reactions, which receive less scientific attention, could have HLA alleles associated, which could explain differences between individuals in reactivity. Importantly, although we may involve dermatopathology for the assessment and evaluation of drug-induced cutaneous eruptions, diagnosis of drug rash remains a clinical one and likely will for the foreseeable future. This should emphasize the importance of keen clinical attention when these eruptions occur in practice. You may ask, what is the importance? If many rashes are benign, why spend the time to assess them and recognize specific syndromes? The problem is twofold. First, if the reaction is simply documented as causing a rash or allergy, the agent may be avoided in the future unnecessarily, which causes enormous impact on the patient's future treatment strategies, especially when antibiotics are implicated, and can lead to actual worse outcomes when they are needed in the future. And second, if the wrong drug is implicated, this could lead to completely unnecessary avoidance of an agent that should not have been identified. We'll practice in this lesson learning how to begin to distinguish between culprits based on syndrome recognition and consideration of latency. Definitive diagnosis is typically only achievable with challenge testing, which is not always feasible or safe, but in many cases can be done easily even in the outpatient setting. Although a skin biopsy could be performed during the acute phase of a drug-induced eruption, unfortunately the dermatopathologic findings from these rashes are often found to be nonspecific and in fact mimic non-drug causes of cutaneous reactions, i.e. the most common being actual viral rashes such as the morbilliform rash and its namesake. Because of this, skin biopsy is of minimal added value and cannot distinguish between drug and non-drug causes of eruptions. That said, when interpreting Dermpath reports, common features of drug-induced reactions include those that involve some form of eosinophilic, neutrophilic, or lymphocytic infiltrate into the dermis or epidermis, very nonspecific, simply indicative of an inflammatory response. Eosinophils, in particular, are not specific to drug reactions. And some reviews have found vacuolar interface dermatitis, a histopathologic finding including vacuolization or membrane-bound compartment presence at the dermo-epidermal junction.
Further, these findings seem to overlap between different drug reactions, so distinguishing this syndrome also remains a clinical problem for now. It is commonly stated that identification of the drug culprit is difficult due to multiple medications being on the chart simultaneously. As we'll discuss, timing of when the drug started actually helps us more than most think when identifying the likely culprit, but even more importantly, definitive diagnosis of drug hypersensitivity is often made since drug rashes are thought to resolve at some point after drug discontinuation. You can imagine that if this happens a few days after stopping an agent, it would be simple to blame the agent. However, you can see how there are many confounders in this regard as well. Imagine a patient develops a viral infection or any infection for that matter, and then starts an antibiotic a few days later. If the rash resolves post stoppage, would it have resolved anyways? Was that simply the expected duration of the rash post viral infection? Ultimately, it's academic since we would never know for sure. Importantly, studies should be done where patients are randomized to stop an agent after identification of a specific benign syndrome or to continue the agent to better characterize the relationship between drug discontinuation and rash resolution. So let's begin by reviewing basic rash nomenclature and terminology that can be used to improve what we can with our ability to describe these reactions. Not only do we want to be able to describe these eruptions more accurately, but the improved ability to communicate these findings can improve our documentation or communication with other clinicians and for research and literature search purposes. If you run into an eruption that you haven't seen before or don't know the syndrome for, you can search for the reaction more effectively by describing it accurately. In general, the blueprint for a complete description of a drug eruption should include the bare bones of the following components. The symptoms associated, if any, non-rash related, the number of lesions, or if the rash is localized or generalized, the colors involved, the character or lesion type, and the location plus minus migration pattern if the rash is spreading. Let's break these down individually. The symptoms associated with the rash can be distinct clues to the syndrome, namely if the rash is pruritic versus non-pruritic, if it involves an anesthetic or parasthetic component, or less commonly for drug reactions, if it is painful. Of note, a rash associated with pain should be considered a red flag if truly drug-related typically involving more severe syndromes. Some rash syndromes are also associated with joint or visceral involvement, so should be stated first. Although most rashes are erythematous, violaceous rashes or hyperpigmented or hypopigmented rashes may be a clue to the syndrome. Importantly, most pictures available for rashes do not include samples of their appearance for all skin tones, where patients with darker skin tones may have obvious erythema, but also possibly more of a hyperpigmented component. Consider how the baseline skin tone of your patient may complicate your color assessment. You may hear or read the term exanthem or enanthem when discussing drug rashes. We will use these terms later on. Really, an exanthem is a rash involving the keratinized epidermis, whereas an enanthem really refers to a mucosal rash. When describing the lesion type or character of the rash, we will need to be able to visually identify and distinguish between skin lesions. Although there are many manifestations of skin disease, too many to discuss here, luckily drug-induced eruptions tend to cause a few specific skin lesions much more commonly than others. In this way, we will only need to be able to identify a select group of lesions. Others may be appropriate reasons for dermatology assessment. These include the morbilliform eruption, the fixed drug eruption, urticarial rashes, vasculitic vesiculobolus, eczematous, targetoid, and much less commonly, photosensitive and other rare rashes. The morbilliform rash seen here is by far the most common drug rash lesion, also commonly called the maculopapular rash or exanthematous rash, very non-specifically. It involves both a macular, so a flat erythematous non-palpable component, and often a papular component, a palpable lesion. The morbilliform rash tends to involve individual lesions which coalesce into larger patches of lesions which cluster on the trunk. The namesake refers to the rash originally caused by measles, although many non-drug insults can cause this rash as well, most commonly viruses. The fixed drug eruption really refers to an isolated single location lesion that appears as a result of drug administration, usually on the face or the hands. Urticarial rashes really involve a very pruritic, generalized, erythematous, and migratory macular and raised rash that changes position constantly, especially during the acute phase. You might circle one of these red spots, but if you come back in a half hour, they have moved. 
This is characteristic for urticaria, what we generally refer to when we say hives. Remember to always clarify what somebody exactly means when they say hives. A purpuric or vasculitic rash really refers to a non-blanchable pinpoint rash that involves the cutaneous manifestation of small vessel vasculitis. These can appear erythematous or violaceous in color. Rashes that blister really are referred to as vesiculobolus when vesicles refer to small blisters and bullae refer mostly to collections of larger vesicles that may coalesce. These types of rashes are distinct and have specific etiologies. Lastly, when discussing location and migration of a rash, there are some specific terms we should use. Rashes on the abdomen, chest, and back can be referred to as truncal plus minus involving the extremities symmetrically or asymmetrically. Intertriginous rashes involve skin folds, i.e. the inguinal folds, the mammary or breast folds, and or the axillary folds. Rashes should be specifically noted, if appropriate, to involve the flexural and or extensor surfaces of extremities. With regard to migration, rashes which start on the trunk and flee to the extremities are centrifugal or center fleeing, whereas those, less commonly, which start on the extremities and spread to the trunk are centripetal. Practice using these terms when identifying a rash to be able to communicate it more clearly in documentation and with your colleagues. Now we will discuss specific drug rashes. Importantly, it is a common misconception that a patient who develops a rash to a drug simply develops one of the possible rashes randomly as if it is selected out of a hat. In fact, each time a patient develops a cutaneous reaction to a drug, a specific hypersensitivity reaction has occurred, which is associated often with a specific rash. Thus, knowledge of the behavior of the syndrome helps us diagnose, manage, and plan for these reactions and what to do about using these agents in the future. Remember that the terminology we use is important, especially when speaking with the patient, as if we use poor terminology and our patient repeats it to another clinician, the truth behind what happened can get lost over time. The word allergy typically is implied to mean an IgE-mediated reaction by most people, but really can refer to any hypersensitivity. Most drug-induced rashes are due to hypersensitivity and not simply due to side effects or non-immunologic reactions. We should always be specific on the timing of the reaction, which can assist in identification of the culprit. Immediate type reactions really narrow down the reaction type to either an IgE-mediated reaction or infusion-related reaction to an agent, whereas more commonly, delayed reactions require a bit more attention to distinguish between. We know that the Gill and Coombs hypersensitivity classes separate reaction by mechanism, drug hypersensitivities mostly fitting into type 4 reactions or those which involve T-cell mediated immune reactions, which can involve recruitment of eosinophils but also neutrophils. Some drug reactions involve a pathophysiology which more closely resembles a type 2 or 3 reaction, but importantly, we should start to see drug reactions as more specific and distinct events rather than simply manifestations of the same umbrella event of rash. Notice how even the type 4 reactions can be split up into different sub-mechanisms. The importance here is not thinking that reactions of different mechanisms can evolve into each other, i.e. just because a patient has one rash, i.e. a benign morbilliform rash, a type 4C reaction, they will not necessarily develop the more severe dress reaction, a type 4B reaction. That said, just like with IgE-mediated allergy, it's always possible for patients to develop more than one reaction, even to the same agent, although this is uncommon. So let's head into our first case. This is a 67-year-old female who's admitted for COVID-19 pneumonia who requires a prolonged stay in the ICU. During this stay, she develops a line-related staph aureus bacteremia and is started on cefazolin. Four days later, the patient is recovering but is discovered to be developing a blanchable, non-pruritic, generalized erythematous maculopapular rash with spread from the trunk to the extremities. The patient didn't notice the rash until the team pointed it out. So what exactly is the diagnosis? What could be the culprits? And what should be done about treatment? This, of course, is the most common bread and butter drug rash, the benign morbilliform reaction, aka the morbilliform exanthema, an extremely common type 4 reaction that is more commonly caused by viral infections, but can be caused by many drugs. Interestingly, this rash specifically is probably more common when patients are co-infected with an active immunomodulating virus, most commonly the herpes viruses, recall the EBV or mononucleosis reaction to amoxicillin, but also other viruses which infect T cells like HIV. 
This rash is easily recognizable since it demonstrates the characteristic morbilliform rash, which can range from absolutely cosmetic and non-pruritic to intensely pruritic, but by definition lacks other systemic features of severity like new fever, CBC abnormalities, or joint involvement. Characteristically, the rash appears about a week after exposure. In our case example, this was four days, highlighting the range that can be seen in real practice, but emphasizing that this is a delayed type hypersensitivity. However, the most important takeaway from learning about this rash is that it is non-life-threatening. Although it is easy to simply stop the drug and avoid it in the future, you will eventually in your practice be in a situation where the drug implicated is the only option or the best option for the patient. In these situations, you can safely continue the drug despite this rash, managing pruritus with antihistamines or topical steroids if needed. In fact, most patients who are re-challenged in the future do not react, but the worst outcome with re-challenge is simply this benign rash. The recognition of this rash should really allow us to mostly immediately delabel most patients, but a simple challenge dose will do if teams are hesitant, giving one small dose and watching for a few days to rule out new rash. Patients should not be contraindicated for use in the future unless dress is suspected. So if we're going to be okay with challenging patients or treating through the benign morbilliform reaction, we have to be confident in our ability to recognize DRESS, which can also present with a morbilliform type rash. DRESS stands for drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms, which really is a misnomer because DRESS does not always involve a detectable eosinophilia. And further, all type 4 reactions would involve eosinophilia in some way, so it's not specific for DRESS. It is a type 4B hypersensitivity, which can involve a morbilliform rash, but also can involve an exfoliative dermatitis or erythroderma, a red flag not present with our benign reactions. More importantly, the patient needs to have systemic symptoms, namely fever, with other features including internal organ involvement, lymphadenopathy, and CBC findings, which we'll discuss. However, one of the most easy to do and critical components of the assessment is the exposure analysis. Remember that the benign morbilliform reaction typically occurs in the first two weeks of therapy, whereas DRESS is known to occur typically after two to six weeks from exposure. Although this is not perfect, it can help us determine the culprit and also contribute to our distinction from benign reactions. Importantly, since DRESS can involve internal organ insult, it qualifies as a severe cutaneous adverse reaction or SCAR, and discontinuation and contraindication is warranted to protect the patient. Importantly, even when we stop the offending agent, these symptoms often tend to persist for a few weeks, so we should remind our colleagues not to start discontinuing other potentially life-sustaining treatments while we manage this supportively. We've described some of the basic features of DRESS, but there are some tools that assist in the more accurate scoring of the likelihood of true DRESS. The Registrar criteria is practical for the recognition of DRESS, which requires a drug rash and hospitalization and latency in the expected two to six week time frame, but in addition, requires at least three out of the four of the following, a drug fever greater than 38 degrees Celsius, usually hectic in pattern, lymphadenopathy, internal organ involvement, for example, a hepatocellular liver injury or AKI, and CBC anomalies like a lymphocytosis or lymphopenia or an eosinophilia. You can see overall that distinguishing dress from a benign morbilliform reaction is quite simple since these dress patients are typically sicker overall and have much more new problems coinciding with the rash onset. Our second patient case is our 58-year-old male who is bitten on the tip of his right third finger while steaming crabs and was started on amoxicillin clavulinate. Five days after starting this agent, he developed acute swelling on the dorsum of his right hand, MCP joints, as well as a new fever, chills, as well as right shoulder, left wrist and hand pain, and the following rash. You can imagine how a treating physician might think that this was uncontrolled or new infection. So what in this case is the most likely diagnosis? This rash is much less common than the morbilliform reaction, but still represents a common drug-induced rash presentation. This reaction is the serum sickness-like reaction, or SSLR, a reaction that phenotypically looks very similar to the classical serum sickness reaction, which involves an immune complex or type 3 hypersensitivity reaction, leading classically to the triad of a pruritic rash, fever, and joint involvement, either arthritis or joint edema. Patients may not have all of these components, but this constellation plus minus GI symptoms in a patient with new rash, especially one that crops around the joints, often the knees, should prompt for SSLR. Notice this rash resembles erythema multiform, 
from this case presentation, although a rash that is less classically targetoid could also resemble the SSLR. This rash occurs approximately 7 to 10 days after exposure, consistent with a delayed hypersensitivity, and characteristically the SSLR involves nil internal organ insult, and this is self-limiting. Importantly, this is another reaction which could theoretically be treated through, and at the very least can definitely be used in the future if needed with successful rechallenge. Antihistamines or short-course PO steroids can assist with pruritus if evident, but remember to not contraindicate patients for this syndrome. Where the classical serum sickness reaction is caused mostly by large proteinaceous molecules like antibodies or antivenoms, the SSLR is caused by smaller molecules like antibiotics. But most classically, the agent with the most supporting literature for being a culprit for the SSLR is a cephalosporin called cephaclor, which is a second generation cephalosporin, not used anymore in Canada, but can classically pop up on a patient's allergy label from a legacy admit where these patients had the agent possibly during childhood. Other agents could include some antidepressants and some infections like streptococcal infections themselves. Importantly, this raises the question, Will patients cross-react with the SSLR in a way that we see with typical IgE-mediated reactions? Some clinicians contraindicate the entire beta-lactam class for delayed hypersensitivity reactions inappropriately. Let the SSLR be a case example of how these delayed reactions are not class-wide cross-reactive, and in fact, patients who received other cephalosporins post-cephaclor SSLR failed to develop the reaction. Another important reaction is the true type 3 hypersensitivity reaction of drug-induced leukocytoclastic vasculitis, really a drug-induced small vessel vasculitis that is difficult to assess since there is a long list of non-drug-related causes of vasculitis that typically need to be ruled out, even if drugs are on the differential diagnosis. As the name implies, patients develop a purpuric rash, typically on the extremities and dependent areas, but this rash is usually asymptomatic and doesn't bother patients. Importantly, visceral involvement can occur very uncommonly with drug-induced leukocytoclastic vasculitis, but consultants are generally called for assessment. The latency is typically one week post-exposure, and the vasculitis is typically self-limiting, resolving in one to two weeks post-withdrawal in the majority of cases, and does not require treatment. Importantly, although beta-lactams are among the most frequently blamed, many drugs can provoke LCV, including NSAIDs, cardiac medications, and antidepressants. In many cases, no culprit can be identified, but even non-drug causes like infections that you might be using the antibiotics for in the first place might be the culprit. Consider these possibilities when deciding on challenging a patient with the agent again in the future, as well as the clinical outcome of the patient post-discontinuation. An interesting rash with a short latency despite being a delayed hypersensitivity type 4 reaction is the symmetrical drug-related intertriginous and flexural exanthema, or strife, which via its namesake refers to an erythematous flat macular confluent rash of the intertriginous and flexural creases symmetrically, which ends up looking like a rash that extends from the perineum up into the axillary region bilaterally. Patients notice this can be pruritic or non-pruritic, but typically occurs strangely within the first two days of administration in many cases. Thankfully, the strife, as you're seeing with many of the most common drug reactions, is benign and involves no threatening internal component, and patients can be treated through if necessary, but this will resolve spontaneously with discontinuation. Patients with history of strife would be good candidates for rechallenge in the future if necessary. Sulfonamides have been implicated, but the most common agent associated with strife is amoxicillin. The fixed drug eruption, or FDE, is another type 4 hypersensitivity reaction which involves the development of usually a single discrete annular or circular erythematous lesion, which most frequently appears on the trunk, hands, or face, that is typically cosmetic only. Interestingly, in patients who are re-challenged with the drug culprit, they will develop the same exact rash at the same exact site. Rarely, the rash can develop into multiple lesions and is rarely dangerous. Typically, this occurs, as with other benign reactions, one to two weeks post-exposure and resolves on its own in a few weeks. Dermatologists may use patch testing to observe for localized FDEs in the out patient office setting, but practically speaking, these reactions can certainly be re-challenged in the future if the agent implicated is absolutely necessary. Common culprits include tetracyclines, sulfonamides, NSAIDs, barbiturates, and carbamazepine, less commonly beta-lactams.
For another case, we have a 25-year-old male who is treated as an outpatient for strep throat, but then presents to the emergency department after developing this rash the same day as starting the antibiotics. The rash is described as a cosmetic, generalized, erythematous maculopustular rash involving innumerable pustular lesions with an erythematous base. The patient denies systemic features of illness. So can you identify correctly the diagnosis in this case? You can imagine how cases as well might be recognized as a cellulitis. This syndrome is known as AGEP, or Acute Generalized Exanthematous Pustulosis, which is another type 4 hypersensitivity that tends to have a very short latency, so typically occurring in the first 48 hours after exposure, often in the same day similar to the reaction strife. The key to clinical diagnosis is recognizing the pustular component with innumerous small pustules on this erythematous base, which may look like the morbilliform rash from the edge of the bed. This rash is actually associated with drug fever and some leukocytosis, but is overall benign. Unfortunately, this rash is commonly confused as a skin soft tissue infection, especially when it starts localized and then spreads, since it can be hot to the touch as well. The pustules will resolve, and the rash typically exfoliates one to two weeks later without complication. Although dermatology is often consulted for the clinical diagnosis, only topical steroids are typically needed for treatment. Rarely, an AKI is associated, and at the current time, it is unknown the safety of rechallenge in cases of AGEP. Importantly, AGEP spares the mucous membranes and can mimic generalized pustular psoriasis or Zumbusch psoriasis. If this was true psoriasis, it would flare with the withdrawal of systemic steroids. As previous, although AGEP is classified along with SJS and DRESS as a scar or severe cutaneous adverse reaction, it is benign and patients do very well and do not progress to internal organ disease. That said, allergy plus minus dermatology follow-up is reasonable and consideration of patch testing should occur to confirm loss of sensitivity over time. For our last patient case, we have a 65-year-old male admitted for recent motor vehicle accident and polytrauma requiring ICU admit found to have an echogenic mobile mass on the mitral valve, as well as gram-positive coxi in the blood. He has started empirically on ceftriaxone and vancomycin for endocarditis and later found to have polymicrobial bacteremia. Two weeks into treatment, the patient develops a vesiculobolus type rash with exfoliative dermatitis. The rash is painful, but spares the mucous membranes. Think about what you on the attending team would be concerned about from a hypersensitivity perspective in this patient, and which drug you would implicate as the culprit. This reaction is known as linear IgA bullous dermatosis. Although it is uncommon, it highlights an example of a hypersensitivity reaction, probably similar to drug-induced bullous pemphigoid, that can look like a Stevens-Johnson syndrome at first, but in fact it is not, and the culprit medication can be very different. In the case of the LABD, it presents with a delayed onset of weeks of an exfoliative dermatitis with a prominent vesiculobolus component with a classic string of pearls appearance you can see in the picture on the right. This can involve the mucous membranes and may appear hemorrhagic. The key in diagnosis involves dermatopathology, a unique feature for drug eruptions, but importantly, although the reaction can involve beta-lactams, it actually occurs most often with vancomycin. So in this case, we should identify the vancomycin being the more likely culprit. Withdrawal is necessary, and interestingly, PO-dapsone is the treatment, and some improvement can be seen with dapsone even as soon as three days post-initiation. Now, before discussing SJS and TEN, we should comment on erythema multiforme, which historically has been considered to be part of the spectrum of SJS to TEN, but now is recognized, in fact, as an entirely separate entity. EM is a type 4 hypersensitivity, but with a different mechanism than SJS, presenting as these classically targetoid lesions of erythema with bilateral symmetry, typically involving the extremities. The center of these lesions might include a vesicular or blistering component. This is delayed days to weeks and is actually an uncommon presentation for drug rash, most classically being involved with HSV infections, aka the term herpes iris, or mycoplasma pneumonia infections. If drugs are involved, NSAIDs and some beta-lactams have been implicated. Treatment is supportive as cases are self-limiting and mild, so are good candidates for re-challenge. Stevens-Johnson syndrome, however, is not re-challengeable. 
the spectrum of SJS to TEN depends on the body surface area involved of the patient, less than 10% being strict SJS, whereas greater than 30% being toxic epidermal necrolysis in between an overlap syndrome. Key alarm features which should prompt the clinical diagnosis of SJS TEN is the presence of a hemorrhagic erythroderma and exfoliative dermatitis, especially when involving the mucous membranes, in particular the mouth. Fever is common and may precede these features, and the rash can become secondarily infected. Classically, this reaction occurs two or more weeks after starting the agent, and this reaction should be considered to be life-threatening with a systemic response that can lead to hypotension and multi-organ damage in addition to the risk of skin sepsis. Permanent contraindication of that class of agent is reasonable given the risk, although we are currently unsure of the cross-reactivity of agents with this reaction. Likely, an HLA type predicts this reaction. Treatments include the use of cyclosporin or other immuno suppressants like etanercept. Drug-induced photosensitivity reactions are a specific group of drug reactions which involve the coupling of drug and UV light exposure. It is thought that these go underdiagnosed and in fact account for approximately 8% of all drug eruptions. Importantly, photosensitivity reactions are split functionally into phototoxic and photoallergic reactions where accumulation of drug or metabolites in the skin lead either to direct skin damage or triggering of a delayed hypersensitivity reaction. Although these two types of reactions are split functionally, clinically there is likely some overlap, but these distinctions will do for clinical practice. The phototoxic reaction is much more common and involves direct cytotoxicity due to increased susceptibility to UV light damage from UVB rays. Therefore, it is commonly recognized since patients develop a sunburn reaction to sun-exposed skin only within hours of exposure to UV light. Antimicrobials that are well known to do this mostly include older agents that are not commonly used today in practice, but we should still counsel for all tetracyclines, fluoroquinolones, but maybe not moxifloxacin, isoniazid and pyrazinamide, TMPSMX, dapsone, and voriconazole most importantly. Interestingly, ceftazidine might do this, although patients are not commonly exposed to UV light during IV therapy. Photoallergic reactions are much less common and involve a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction to UVA activated haptonized drug, thus developing a hypersensitivity rash, non-sunburn rash, days after exposure to sun-exposed skin that characteristically spreads to non-exposed skin, often in a morbilliform, vesicular, or even an erythema multiform pattern. NSAIDs are typically the most implicated, but norfloxacin can do this in addition to topical acyclovir, where a photoallergic contact dermatitis might occur. Now let's finish with some very rare drug rashes that should round out our knowledge on drug eruptions for practice. Lichenoid drug eruptions involve the development of a rash that appears like lichen planus with a characteristic scaling dry plaque formation usually on sun exposed skin weeks to months after long term therapy with a drug. Although the drugs implicated with LDEs are often non antimicrobials, anti malarials and anti tubercular antibacterials have been implicated. Withdrawal causes resolution over weeks to months and topical steroids may be sufficient if treatment is required. Drug-associated bullous pemphigoid, or DABP, is extremely rare but involves a likely HLA-mediated autoimmune reaction of unclear mechanism after days to weeks of drug exposure causing an aggressive hemorrhagic vesiculo bullous drug eruption that evolves from an initially pruritic urticarial lesion. This can involve the oral mucosa but typically doesn't involve viscera. Antimicrobials are uncommon culprits, although levofloxacin and rifampin have been identified as likely culprits based on recent reviews. Importantly, nil rechallenge confirmation has occurred with antimicrobials, but it has for ASA and some monoclonal antibodies. PO steroids are justified, but in some rare cases, the disease can be chronic and lifelong even after withdrawal. Lastly, the extremely rare mycosis fungoides-like reaction, which involves a rash that mimics the cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. This reaction is coined as a pseudolymphoma, which is benign, characteristic in HIV-positive patients. The rash itself appears weeks after starting the agent, but it appears as a non-paritic maculopapular rash that evolves and coalesces into diffuse erythematous plaques and vesicles, as you see here. The rash can be associated with fever and eosinophilia, but is otherwise non-life-threatening.
This rash is classically associated with anticonvulsants, namely phenytoin, but has also been associated with vancomycin and rifampin, in addition to rarely some beta-lactams, dapsone, and nitrofurantoin. The rash has been known in case reports to resolve over a period of three to four weeks with PO steroids and drug discontinuation. So we've covered many drug-induced rashes, but certainly the most common presentations that would occur with cutaneous adverse effects involving antimicrobials. Let's review by putting into perspective the timeline for drug exposure analysis. Remember that reactions that occur immediately after an infusion within the first 60 minutes of dose administration are typically IgE-mediated reactions, infusion reactions, or phototoxic reactions at the earliest. Reactions in the 1 hour to 48 hour period include the short latency delayed reactions of AGEP and Strife, whereas most of our benign delayed reactions occur in the first two weeks post exposure. 14 days is later than usual, like the benign morbilliform reaction, FDEs, and SSLRs. Helpfully, severe delayed reactions that are threatening tend to occur more than two weeks after exposure, such as SJSTEN, DRESS, and linear IgA bolus dermatosis. And that completes our discussion of drug-induced cutaneous eruptions. As a summary of key learning points, remember that the diagnosis of these rashes will remain clinical since dermatopathology can only provide subtle, nonspecific evidence of inflammation rather than the ability to distinguish between drug and non-drug causes. Most reactions are non-IgE mediated and involve a benign reaction, although reactions should be diagnosed carefully to exclude serious reactions like DRESS and SJSTEN with attention to any erythroderma or, or exfoliative dermatitis. Lastly, careful attention to the timeline of latency and exposure helps in culprit identification rather than blaming the first beta-lactam seen on the chart. Use this knowledge of the syndrome and hypersensitivity to better make a diagnosis for these rashes to plan on next steps and management. Thank you for watching.